Hey there, planet Earth! What's up? And welcome to this sci-fi novel literature review. Today we are reviewing Aftershocks, The Palladium Wars by German author Marco Kluze. If you don't know who Marco Kluze is, he actually wrote Lucky 13 and Shapeshifters for Netflix's original animated series Love, Death and Robots, which is pretty awesome. But his best known work was the frontline series of military science fiction novels. Now, I must admit that I have not read any of those, but I do have a soft spot for military science fiction, which has its roots in classics such as Robert Heinlein's Starship Troopers and Orson Scott Card's Ender's Game. And who doesn't like a story of lasers, spaceships, and mayhem set among the stars with lots of pew, 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 pew. like Star Wars being a really big example of that. And if it's one thing that has remained constant throughout human history is war. War never changes. But this novel, Aftershocks, takes a look at war after the fact. Which is something that tends to be overlooked. The aftermath of war that can almost be as deadly as the actual conflict itself. And I guess that's why the book is called Aftershocks, right? Like the aftershocks of an earthquake that can cause a lot more destruction than the actual event. And if you look at history, it was pretty much the aftermath of World War I that set the stage for the even worse conflict that was World War II. No World War I, no Hitler, no World War II. Off topic, if you want to see the application of unsupervised machine learning algorithms like self-organizing maps and k-means clustering to earthquake aftershocks clustering, Check out this repo on GitHub right here. Uh, that was an awesome project and experience for me to work on. I might make a video on it later. If you want to see that kind of data science videos and stuff, drop this video a like and I'll be sure to give it some work during the holidays. And But whatever, onwards with the literature review. Hey. Aftershocks is a pretty new book actually. It released in July 2019 and I found it under the new releases of Auckland Public Library. I picked it up, started reading it, and I was hooked. One chapter turned into three, and a few more characters later, the next thing I knew, I was committed to finishing the whole thing, which is saying something for a book that, that you just randomly pick up at the library. And Aftershocks is set in the Gaia system, which is a faraway solar system, a fictional extrasolar system of six planets, of six exoplanets, each having its own unique space-faring people. You have the Hadeans from Hedea, which is, I think is named after Hades, because it's like Mercury, it's very hot and it's the closest planet to the star. You have the Asheroni from Asheron, which are these East Asian Micronesia type people, and their planet is very Venus-like, it's covered in thick clouds. And Asheron is actually the Greek word for swamp, and Venus, the second planet in our solar system, was mistakenly in the 1960s thought to have like this global swamp on it. That was a misconception. Astronomers do make mistakes sometimes, but we progress from our mistakes and that's what science is. You have the Oceanians from Oceania. Surprise, surprise, the planet is made of a giant world ocean with very little island land masses. And the Palladians from Pallas, which is like the mountainous planet, home to very fierce brown-skinned warrior people. Think of like Nepal, but in space. Now their planet is special because it has a valuable resource called Palladium, which is where the Aftershocks series gets its title from, the Palladium Wars. He who controls the Palladium controls the Gaia system, something like that. A bit of real science there, palladium is actually a real-life element that can be used as a superconductor. And in Aftershocks, it's pretty much the oil of the series. But the author extends its value to a completely fictional application uh, because palladium is used to inside what's called a GravMag generator that makes artificial gravity possible on their starships. Yeah, kind of a MacGuffin. And the last two planets are Rhodia, which is your typical Anglo-Western civilization people, the good guys, and Gretia, which is totally space Germany and a very important subject in the story. Now, each of these planets has their own unique geography, but 
Gratia alone is the most Earth-like and is the easiest to colonize with minimal effort, while the other planets are only partially habitable and require more effort to live on. The Rhodians, for example, have to build these massive arcology structures because their planet is made up of a, of a lot of active lava fields and their planet has two moons and the result is these two massive moons cause intense waves and tidal forces that make life on the seashore impossible and the Asheronis have to build their cities like floating cities above the clouds which in the book was told to have like the most amazing sunset ever sunset and sunrise and the Palladians of course being very mountainous planet have to carve theirs into the side of very steep mountains and every bit of space is fought after you know chiseled out of the mountainside and if you think about it from a planetary science perspective this Gaia solar system has got quite a few planets within its habitable zone the region around a star where liquid water can exist you can think of Gretia as owning prime real estate in that zone the best spot with other worlds kind of tapering off towards the more hellish side Hadia, with other worlds like kind of being tapering off habitable. towards the more hellish side as you get closer and in fact to the in sun, the book Hadia, uh, like mercury the habitable the area habitable. of the entire planet Hadia is just and in fact in the book, one circular uh, region the habitable the area of the entire planet, planet Hadia is just this i think that one circular region on the planet, around the northern polar now, i think of this whole planet. solar system I think design is really interesting because the author is imagining author a very rich i think this whole solar system all the design is really interesting because the author is Imagining, in, in my very opinion, rich is a very good example where all the drama is going to play out. I felt this novel, very interested in the distinction in my opinion, between is a very good example of the Gaia system. The novel has I felt a very, very heavy in emphasis the on the between the various of people each of the Gaia system. The novel has a very if you heavy emphasis the on the distinction distinctions between planetary cultures and the Terrans. You think of the expanse and then there's the Belters. So you get some of that. Martians it and talks the about, Terrans the and the talks Expanse about the and then cultures there's the Belters. As so much as it does some talk about the futuristic it talks about, technologies the book talks about the that make the warfare and the drama happen. As much happen. as it does talk... So the story in Aftershock takes place five years after a massive solar system war where millions of people die and Gretia loses this war against an alliance of the other planets and Gretia is occupied. It's it's sort of like a post-war Germany and of course the author Marco Cluse being German is basing the story on the experience of his forefathers. So I felt like the parallels drawn in the novel were grounded in a lot of realism which makes the geopolitics very gritty. You can kind of relate to it from recent history and the world wars being the most incredible event in our recent history you kind of feel it reflected and mirrored inside the novel the geopolitics and aftershocks is a combination of both post world war one and world war two where you have massive war reparations on the losing side occupation of the homeland of the losing side and the collapse of a highly militarized government institution or system of order which has been in place for hundreds of years prior and the parallels actually are pretty great the Gretians are these people who value order in their society to real life which is similar to real life German society if any of you guys have ever been to Germany and they get called the derogatory name fuzzhead which is which kind of reflects their military aspect militaristic aspect of their past society and this system of government is yanked from under the carpet prior to the start of the novel resulting in this power vacuum and this results in a powder keg political climate that explodes it literally explodes during the novel now there are four pov characters in the book that come from different backgrounds each having different skill sets the main character is aiden robertson who's a gretian pow prisoner of war was a member of the Black Guards, the notorious Black Guards. And they're the equivalent of the Nazi SS in the Gretian military. And this character, in a turn of events, is released out into the solar system after five years of imprisonment on an allied planet. And the author built up these legendary Black Guards through, through the early exposition as this all-around feared group of ruthless killers during the solar system war. 
But the main character, Aiden, he, he wasn't really a frontline soldier. He was more of a, uh, he worked in linguistics and intelligence. So he's more of a spy. And I think this is interesting because it's a new type of role and character skill set that we don't normally get in sci-fi. Your typical, your typical lead character is usually some spaceship captain or genetically engineered soldier slash chosen one. But in this story, the lead is this older age dude with skills in language and spycraft. And there are like six freaking languages in this solar system. So he's the perfect guy to operate in that environment. And which totally adds a different dimension to how the story plays out and how the character would react and approach a situation. You know, he's less Master Chief and more James Bond. Now his storyline evolves more like an espionage drama rather than a straight up pew 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 lasers by the numbers action. Now the other main characters in the book is a Palladian soldier named Idina Shouder. Uh, her rank is that of uh, flag sergeant. Was a sergeant and she's a total badass in a mech suit if you can think of bobby draper's character from the expanse then that's pretty much that's pretty accurate and the combat in the universe of aftershocks is a mix of near future and far future there's drones and exosuits and rail guns as well as ai in the mix while also introducing some impossible MacGuffin-like technology, like energized riot shields, ionized riot shields, and binary artillery propellant, whatever that is. But all of that advanced tech is not used in a one-on-one -on -one engagement situation, but it's in the book, it's used in the context of an insurgency. So it's, it gets pretty nasty. The situation is like Afghanistan times 1000 taking the place taking place in space Germany and that's what uh, Idina is going through as she patrols the occupied planet and I thought her parts were pretty good now the third POV character in the novel is Lieutenant Commander Dunstan Park which is uh, he's a Rodian and his role is more of your traditional ship captain archetype seen in sci-fi and i found his segments the least intriguing from all the other characters and it ends up and his parts end up getting menacingly cut off at the end before it gets really interesting the storyline i mean uh dunstan park's storyline provides insight to the space combat and tactics in the world of aftershocks which seem to be taking a page from the expanse where gravity and acceleration plays a big role in how the spaceships duke it out in space. And I'm not going to talk about it here, but Star Wars style space dogfights are super unrealistic since space is a vacuum. Spaceship trajectories don't actually behave like airplanes. It's less Bernoulli's principle and more Newton laws of motion in space combat. And the technology also comes into the mix here because the, te the technology, the ship weaponry, comes down to a mix of rail guns, missiles, and point defense systems. Uh, AI is also given quite a big emphasis in the world, both in space and on the ground, but for the most part, there aren't any flashy laser beams or plasma torpedoes like that. But there is the use of uh, directed energy weapons, which is a different thing entirely. It's not used to zap other spaceships, but as a defensive countermeasure, which makes it more realistic. I mean, using high intensity microwaves to disable incoming missiles. And there's a really cool scene in the combat where two incoming missiles are disabled with the first one being a soft kill that just scrambles its electronics. And the second one is exploded, boom, with the use of more microwave energy. So it's space combat that makes you think I mean, it's not as illogical as turning off your targeting computer and using the force. If I wanted to use the force, I would just Ryan Johnson the story out of my butthole. Ugh. The last POV character in the Aftershocks novel is Solvig Ragnar, who is the only civilian character in the book. She's this corporate heiress, uh, but she, yeah, which totally makes me think of Who's that Hilton girl? Ah, I forgot. Paris Hilton, but she's not like that. She's smart, okay? She's loyal. She, and she inherits her father's corporate empire in the aftermath of the war. Because Gretia loses the war, they, their 
top management of all the companies that uh, funded the war effort gets decapitated and she is brought in because she is of, of just the right age that she could succeed her father in leadership of Ragnar Industries. A lot of the Gretian stuff has like German myth inspired names like uh, Ragnar and uh, Mjolnir. One of the ships is called Mjolnir and Lagertha. Yeah. Lagertha land system. So they're really building up a distinction between a lot of the different cultures. And it's, it's, I mean, science, all of fiction is just a reflection of reality, right? So the, the author is really just reflecting local culture and divisions and realities in, in real life and putting them in the context of this space society and space culture. And she's this young and intelligent character that has a very suspenseful secret revealed in the novel. I won't spoil anything here because it's a pretty major plot line, but I thought her parts were written pretty well, but you don't get nearly enough time with her. And that's pretty much the main gripe actually I have with this novel is that it's not long enough. The book has a less than 300 page count, which I felt could have been, let me open it right here. It's like the book ends at page 278, which I think could have been bumped up to 350 to satisfyingly flesh out the world and the solar system and the characters. But the author, Marco Clues, has meant for this book, Aftershocks, to be the first entry in a much bigger story. And hopefully the next installment is progressively much thicker like the Harry Potter novels. I mean, if you look at the thickness of the first Harry Potter novel all the way to the last one, they, the books got thicker and thicker as they built up a, a, this huge myth. And my reaction upon finishing Aftershocks was that I felt like it hadn't even started. And a lot of the other reviews on Goodreads are saying the same thing. So my conclusion is that if you like space operas like The Expanse, and if you are down to committing yourself to a completely new and original sci-fi universe, grounded in realism but with enough socio-cultural, geopolitical commentary spice added into the mix that will hopefully develop and flower over the next uh, half a decade of storytelling, then this series, The Palladium Wars, is definitely a good one to pick up to start with. I know the next book is, is coming out next year, so it is quite a long wait in my opinion. And But this series, I think, is one to watch out for in the future. Read it now before it gets made into a Netflix original series. <laughs> That's all for me. Thanks for watching, and I will see you guys on the frontier. A German author, Marcos Clues. Or Marco Clues. Marco Clues. <laughs>